So Carl, like, like we were just talking, you've been fighting us for 20 years. Why should I believe that you're innocent? Because I have documents. I, when I first got arrested back in 1998, and they asked me did I know Maurice Purify, I told the detectives I did not know Maurice Purify. Never heard of Maurice Purify, besides being on a radio station and being on the news. And just so happened when we heard of the um, radio station that Maurice was murdered, me, my mother, and Donna Flowers was together taking Donna Flowers mm -hmm. to work. Yeah, so talk about that the night before. So the night that Maurice was uh, um, killed, June 15, 1998, you were with your girlfriend, correct? Yes, she's my baby mother now. She's my she's a child. She, my child is from her, mm -hmm. Carl Willis Jr. So what were you doing that night? We was babysitting my sister, Kiva Johnson, children. We supposed to all went out. And my allergies started bothering me. And so I'm like, I don't feel like going. And my sister couldn't find no babysitter. So me and Donna decided to stay at her house and babysit my nephews. Hmm. So you didn't even leave the house? No, I went to get, I left the house and it was about between five and six o'clock in the evening. I went to get them some pizza, my nephews, and I came back. Wow. Um, so the first time that you heard about the murder was when? Well, um, the following morning, when Donna had to go to work, me, I went down to my mother's house. My mother stayed on the street from my sisters. And we went down to my mother's house to ask my mother, can she take Donna to work? And my mother said, yeah. So we, we had to let time my mother to get um, dressed and be prepared to drop her off to work. And on the way to dropping Donna off to work, because she worked at Lone John Silvers. Mm -hmm. And we listened, my mom always listened to 95.7. Ra um, radio station, and we listened to the radio station and the process of taking her to work. And they, um, it was a segment that came on stating what happened last night. Hmm. And that, and that probably made you sad because someone died, but it didn't mean anything to you because you had nothing to do, and you did not. Did they mention Maurice's name at that point that he had been killed, or did they just say a 13-year-old boy was killed? I can't, I can't, I can't exactly remember how the, how the statement came on, mm -hmm. but I remember that it said there was a um, a, a young man that was found in the middle of the street, in the city streets of Toledo, Ohio. Yeah. So then, what happened? I mean, did did you know Travis Slaughter? I knew of him, but I didn't know him personally enough to say that I knew him. Yeah. But when was the last time you saw him? There was an incident at like one of your relatives' house or something. Don, um, Travis came to my mom's house, and he kept on trying to lure me to the alley. And I told Travis, like, I'm not going to the alley. I don't know what you want. I don't know what you're saying, what you're trying to do, but you need to talk to me, you can talk to me right here. And Wayne was, Wayne was happening to be coming up the street, coming from the store. And he was like, what's going on? I'm like, I don't know what Travis is on. But he trying to get me to the alley. I said, man, he, you know, he, he, it's too, he, he drawing too much attention. I said, whatever he on, man, I ain't on what he on. So Wayne confronted him, and Travis took off. Hmm. What did you think Travis wanted to do? Do you think he wanted to try to hurt you? The way he was acting, it seemed like he had a weapon, and he was trying to cause some physical harm. Now, did he have something against you? I mean, was he upset because of your and Wayne's relationship? Um. It came out. He came out. It was mm -hmm. because since my incarceration, and after, he wrote me an affidavit and he wrote me a letter stating his upbringing and how his mother had him prostituting to um, men and women because of her drug addiction, and that he was jealous of our bond and we wouldn't let him in mm -hmm. because me and Wayne we grew up from childhood, and me and him had a close bond. We had a. a, a family bond, like a right. brother close, we were cousins, but it was more on a brother's side because we were the same age. Right. So tell me about when they came and how did you end up, did the detectives come to your house, they tracked you down, I mean, what happened? Well, August the 28th, 1998, I was sitting in my mother and father house on Miller. We have a house that was on any Anna and Miller at the time. 
and we just we was in the process of moving from one from one house to the other house, and I was sitting in a house, and I seen the I seen the detectives and the police surround my mother's house on Indiana and Miller, so I go outside. I'm like, what's going on? And you had no idea that I never I didn't know I didn't know what they was I didn't know if they were doing a raid. I didn't know if they was coming for um, an incident. I didn't know what was going on. I just knew that it didn't look right. And so when I stepped out, my brother said, what did you do? I said, I ain't did nothing. He said, they looking for you. I said, they looking for me. I said, they can't be looking for me. I ain't did nothing. So the detective said, there he go right there. And he grabbed me and he, he put the handcuffs on me and read me my Miranda rights and transported me to the um, Scott Park District Station. Did they tell you when they read your rights, did they tell you why they were taking you in? They said they was always in question of a murder. Huh. And your thought was? You got the wrong guy. Had you been in trouble at that point? I mean, had you, did the police know you? I mean, what kind of? I have been in juvenile, I have been in juvenile trouble, but there's nothing to that magnitude. Yeah, yeah. Like no violent type thing. No. I, I had no um, strong um, robbery that would, drop, that would drop down to an assault. Mm -hmm. And I did four months in Stryker. Yeah. And then you turned your life around. You're like, I'm not doing that. Anymore. Yeah, because I, I, I don't like conservation. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what happened when they took you in and they started talking to you? They took me in the Scott Park District Station. They started questioning me about, um, do, I, do I know Maurice Purify? Do I know Travis Slaughter? Do I know Wayne Brady? I stated to them that I didn't know Maurice Purify. I knew of Travis Slaughter, and I know Wayne Brady. Did they, now at some point, you offered to take a lie detector test, is that correct? Yes. So, so tell me about that. So you offered to take a lie detector So when they, say, they said, we know, you, we, we, we know you have something to do with this case. I said, no, I do not have nothing to do with this case. Whatsoever, I don't have no knowledge of this case. I don't know what happened with this case. I don't have, I don't, like, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, they said, Travis said you did this, and Wayne said you did that. I said, well, they lying. So they gave me, they took me into a, a room, and they had a, TV, they had a TV in there with a VCR. They put the VCR on, and they showed Travis making a confession and make, acting a damn fool, talking about me, him, and Wayne committed this case, committed this murder. You know, I, 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 um, I dragged him down to, I dragged him by a tree, this, this, and that. I'm like... Hold on, and he's my coming from a house party of a lady named um, Tank, uh, Tanky. And I'm like, I know Tanky, but I've never been to her house. So they cut the videotape off and told me, um, you lying. I said, if you think I'm lying, I'm willing to take a polygraph test right now. And they was like, well, we, we look at, we're looking to that, but right now, you need to confess and tell me everything that happened. So I said, okay, I need an attorney because you don't want to take my word that I wasn't involved with this case. So I need my attorney. So they stopped, our, they stopped the um, questioning and interrogation and they called uh, Marty Dow because that's the only attorney I could think of because I've never been in no trouble so I don't know no attorneys to be, be calling on. But by me being with the little trouble I had was and been before as far as the strong arm robbery broke down to an assault, I used Marty Dow, so I told him to call Marty Dow. And Marty Dow came, uh, came to Scott Park Station. What did he tell you? I mean, what? Did he say this is all a mistake? They're going to let you go? I mean, where you, where you? Marty Dow said that he, he, he usually only deal with misdemeanors and that this is way over his head, that um, he, uh, I, I need to find another attorney because right now, the attorney that he are that he don't he never dealt with um, a case of this magnitude. Wow. So did they ever show you anything about Wayne saying that you were involved? They never showed me anything they with the main confession. They said that you were involved. Yes. But they never showed you anything. No. And you don't believe that Wayne said anything as far as like you being involved. No, because before we even left Scott Park District Station, they put me and Wayne in the same room together, and I asked Wayne what was going on. He said, I don't know if Travis on some bullshit. I said, Wayne, I wasn't, I don't know what's going on. 
I don't have no clue what's going on. And you know anything, you need to let me know now. Wayne said, Bub, because that's my nickname. He said, I promise you, Travis on some bullshit. I don't have nothing to do with this case. I don't have no knowledge of this case. So what are you thinking at that point? I'm thinking of this like, they about to let us go. Because I know damn well that I wasn't with Wayne and I know I wasn't with Travis. So I'm like, I'm on home. But I'm like, man, if you don't have nothing to do with this case, you should be going too. But at the time, I can only focus on myself because I know, I know, I know they try to say that we're together, all three of us together. And I know I wasn't with Wayne or Travis. Hmm. Did, so you told them that you were with Donna yes. and you were babysitting. Did that, that it just didn't mean anything to them? Did they offer, did they talk to these other people? They talked to Donna and they threatened to take, Donna had two children at the time. She had two what? Children. And when they talked to Donna, they try to use, say, that they go take her kids. They try to use all kind of intimidation. And I know that because when I called her when I was in the county jail, she said that they talking about taking my baby. This is my this, this is my this. I'm lying for you, this and that. I told them that me and you was together, that you're not that kind of person. Yeah. Yeah, and she obviously probably told them that he was with me. And they asked her, how do, how do you recall that he was with, with, with you at this time? She said, because I, I, came, I came over his, over his sister's house from work. And the previous day, we had, I had to go to work again. And so I stayed over there and went to work from his house, from his sister's house. Mm -hmm. hmm. So talk about the trial a little bit. Um, so where were you still in the trial? That's so at some point in the trial, they said that you saw something, right? And there was something with your eyesight, that you had like bad eyes. Yes. What I didn't they, wear glasses back then. Okay. So they what? said that I was the one that spotted Maurice Purified. Travis said this. At like three in the morning or yes. whatever it was. In the dark. Yes. Now, if I took off my glasses, I can barely see you. Mm -hmm. So if I didn't have glasses, I didn't wear glasses then because I didn't think glasses was cool. So I was still growing into the person I am today. So I didn't wear glasses because it wasn't, it, it didn't, I thought I looked funny in them. So it's impossible for me to see anybody from a distance without my glasses on. And they said you're the one that spotted Maurice. Yes. Um, yeah. So, so what, what are you thinking when Maurice is up on the stand and Travis, you meant? Travis, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, Travis. So when Travis is up on the stand and, and he's giving his version of events, what are you thinking? I'm thinking I'm going home because, to my knowledge at the time, the testimony is supposed to be truthful. And he sit there and said that this is my false statement, this is my false statement, I gave, I, this is one of my false statements. Because the, the, uh, when he's doing the cross-examination, cross -examination, he kept on stating that he was lying. And then he said he finally told the truth after the detectives and prosecutors showed him the record of the case. So I'm like, right then and there, that this case is all, that I should be able to walk home, we should be able to go home because he sat there and told them people that he was lying, that he didn't tell the truth until he got a deal. Did you want to testify? Yes, I did. Donna wanted to testify as well on my behalf and my sister Keeper. Why didn't you or her? We was advised by Peter Boyer, who was my counsel at that time, not to. We, he said that they didn't prove nothing. It was on the state to prove that we was innocent, that we was guilty, and that we was innocent, as far as his eyes, and that we shouldn't have that we shouldn't have to even, uh, get up there because what Travis is saying don't make sense. I told him that I still want to get up there and let them know where I was at, who I was with, and what we was doing. He said, "You don't have to do that, Carl." He said you don't have to do that? Yes. I said Donna, Donna was at my trial, and she was sitting in the, um, in, in the seating where the people come to, I don't know what that session is called, but she's sitting in that section where the rest of the family was at. And she is there, and she asked Peter Boyer, can she testify on my behalf? And he, was, he told her that he didn't have to, they wouldn't believe her because we was in an intimate relationship. And he told her that 
by Kiva being my sister that they wouldn't believe her because she we have um that's my brother that was our brother. But they would leave. They would believe a convicted child rapist and a killer. So yeah, I mean, so how hard did you fight Peter to, or did you just go along because okay, he's a defense attorney. He knows what he's talking about. I. I was I was I was ab I was abnant about telling my side of the story. I told him more than one time I wanna I wanna get on there I wanna get on the stand I wanna get on the stand. Do you blame him now? I don't know I don't have I don't have no hard feelings I don't blame him. Who are it, it's like with me. I can honestly say, after reviewing this case, got to really sit down and going through the paperwork and everything that the detectives and the prosecutor, they knew we was innocent and they made a big fuss about we was guilty and they had to let us go because we got out on this case before in 98. Right, yeah, the grand jury refused to indict you. The yes, and when they came back before, they said the only way that they can indict us, they come back with new witness and new evidence. What was the new evidence? I'm not 100% sure because I've never seen the grand jury transcripts, but Sandria wasn't part of the first arrest, and we were going to our pre-hearing. It was he, she wasn't. Her name wasn't never involved. So you think Chandria's testimony was what got you? Yes, because they said the only way they can come back if they have new witness and new evidence. Only thing that changed was Chandria. And she has since signed an affidavit saying that you guys are innocent. Yes. So at this point, there's nobody saying that you're guilty. Yes. How does that make you feel? I'm still incarcerated. My children still have to grow up with our father. My mother's in the hospital. I lost my father since I've been incarcerated. What's your uh, headspace at this point? Do you, do you think that you ever get out of there? I put it in God's hands. I don't have no control of the situation. The situation is bigger than me. I don't think it's about conviction no more. Because if they was to see conviction, they would never let Travers go. Because after Travers wrote his affidavit back in 2002, mm -hmm. and the courts had knowledge of it since 2006. If they were so adamant about finding justice for Maurice Purify, I truly believe that they wouldn't have let him go. And when we had our hearing, he would have made sure all parties were there. And, and now Travis is out. Yes. They released him in September of 2017. Yeah. Yeah, we found him. <laughs> we found him in uh, Akron. I mean, we didn't talk to him personally. We were texting, but we found where he was living. So um, so what are you thinking when the, the jury is, you know, they ended up deliberating for 26 hours. So what, what are you thinking when they're in there that long? I just knew I was going home. So when you were waiting for the jury to come back, um, Wayne was in a cell and you were like next to him and he said you're reading uh, your Bible. Yes. Um, so at that point, you're still thinking, I'm going home. I believe that God was going to deliver me from the situation. Yeah. So when they came back and they said, Guilty on the first count, guilty on the second count. What what are you doing? Honestly, when they said Carl Willis, aggravated murder, count one, guilty, I wasn't even myself. Only thing I could say is for something I didn't do. I didn't have no control of my reaction. It's not like I just, just like I just intended to do that. It's just the way it came out. Cause I sat there the whole trial and I had to listen to lies being told upon me that I know I wasn't involved with. Was it really hard for you not to stand up during the trial and say, that's not true? Yes, very hard. Can you put yourself in my shoes for a second and anybody else who may see this? You sitting there at a trial, 20 years old, knowing damn well that you innocent and you hearing, hearing the prosecutor 
turn, portraying you as a monster, as if you don't fit in society. You're hearing lies being told from you at all angles from a guy that don't even know he, without him, there, there, there's, there's nothing to even link me to this case. And you ain't do nothing but try to help this fella before. And he's sitting there just lying at you, saying you did this, then that. And you don't have no control over you have to just sit there and just, just take that abuse. I think it'd be hard for anybody to sit there and be still. But you're not a monster, are you? I'm not a monster at all. What was Carl Willis like when he was 20 years old? Family orientated. I was troubled, but at the same time, I wasn't troubled to the point of harming anyone. I dropped out of school at a young age because of dysfunctional reasons. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I've always been around my family, always been around love, my loved ones. I never ventured outside of, no, outside of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. I'm not sitting here portraying as if I was just a saint, because that's not who I was. But at the same time, I wasn't no troubled child either. I had a good upbringing. Does that even make sense to you that you guys would grab the same gun and pass it around? I mean, that doesn't make sense. For one, coming from the area and the culture I come from, who in their right mind but go hurt a 13-year-old child? You gotta have a motive. You gotta have some kind of connection. You gotta have some kind of demon, de demonic spirit in you to wanna go hurt a child. I have nephews and nieces that was at the age. And if someone hurt my nephews and nieces, I know I'd be upset. So why would I go hurt somebody else? Child or nephew. Any of your nephews and nieces know uh, Maurice? No. Are they from different areas? They're from different areas. Mm -hmm. But Travis said you had a motive because he paid you two hundred dollars, right? Two hundred dollars. Two hundred dollars to go commit a murder. Two hundred dollars won't allow you to get an attorney. I knew that from back then. And then he said he didn't even give you the $200. <laughs> and he took $79 from uh, Maurice's pocket and refused to give you any of that. Right? That's what the record state. That makes sense to you? I don't think it made sense to nobody. I don't think nobody in America makes sense to. To me, it seems like coming from culture you come from. You're going to kill a 13-year-old kid. Someone says they're going to give you money. They don't give you any money. Seems like you'd be really mad about that and you probably wouldn't let him walk away. All right? Said. So it still doesn't make any sense to you. <laughs> what what possibly what possibly can $200 do? $200 is, even though back then, considering the age, it was, it's, a, it's a piece of money, but $200 to go commit a crime? To kill a 13-year-old. What, what, what possibly can you, what, what possibly can even a 13-year-old be involved with that you, that you want to do something to him for $200? That's a child. A child you did not know. Not, that, 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 that I did not know. I never had no connection with. Never even heard. If he, if he was to walk past me at that time, I wouldn't know who he was because we never had any interactions. I didn't know his friends. I don't know his family. <coughs> I didn't know his family or friends. There's no one that can lead me to this case besides Trevor Slaughter. And obvious that the prosecutor even stated that Trevor Slaughter is a habitual liar. So how can Trevor Slaughter hold a conviction and when Trevor Slaughter came and get me indicted? 
So tell me about your life now. What, um, do, you, what do you do in prison? I'm in St. Clair College, taking a sociology and criminal justice. So what do you want to do when you get out? I wrote a program called Leaving the Streets Behind. It's a mentoring program. Do you run a program in here? No, I oh. wrote the program since oh. I've been incarcerated. It's called Leaving the Streets Behind. Hmm. It's a mentoring program directing the youth to a better path. So you want to work with young people? Yes, mentoring. Mm -hmm. Positive mentoring. So how's school going? It's going very well. I've been on, I've been on a dean list since I've been going to Sinclair College since 2017. Are you almost done? No, I'm, I'm, I'm doing Pathways next, next um, semester. They're going to start, we can start working on towards our degrees. Um, so that's your full-time job? So you don't have to have another job? No, I'm a tutor as well. A tutor? Okay. Yes. What, do you, what do you tutor people in? Uh, helping them get their GEDs. So how have you changed since you've been in, been in here? I got educated because I didn't have my GED when I got incarcerated. I got my education. I'm going to college. I wrote a program called Leaving the Streets Behind. And I just want to, when I see young fellas coming in, in the institution, I try to talk to them and try to help them get the education and try to give them another, per, give them another perspective of where they at. Because I actually grew up in here. Do you dream about the day that you're going to get out? Every night, tossing and turning, hoping that God touch somebody's heart. What's that dream look like when you walk out of here? I just want to hope by God's will, my mother still be alive, and I'll be able to see my mom, and I can grab my children, spend time with them, and go to a, find a, a good praying church that I know that I'll be able to get my spiritual healing from and go back into the community and let them see that just because you come from the bottom don't mean you can't change. Have you let have you let all the anger go? Because I know you had to be angry. I would be when you came It took a lot for me to forgive. Forgive Travis Slaughter? And Sandria. Mm -hmm. But I have forgave him. It's not even worth it. Mm -hmm. For me to hold on to anger and be bitter, it would stop my growth, my development as becoming a successful man one day. Okay. What do you, uh, I'll just give you the final say. I mean, what do you want to tell people? What do you want to tell people about Carl Willis? That Carl Willis is an innocent man. I didn't have no ties to this case, don't have no ties to this case. I send my condolence to the Maurice family, but I'm not responsible for Maurice's death. And if anybody out there to have any knowledge of this case, if there's anybody out there that can actually bring forth the truth and clear my name, and Wayne Brady's name is innocent because I wasn't with Wayne Brady, but I believe he's innocent, that you come over, that you come forward and tell the truth, because my family is suffering, and I'm tired of suffering for something I ain't had nothing to do with. Do you think there's someone out there that knows something? Even if it takes for Travis to come and tell the truth finally and quit running from the truth. I mean, he signed an affidavit, so he did in the affidavit. But he wrote an affidavit. But he didn't show up in court. You see, the state tried to play a trickery game, psycho reverse psychology. They try to say if Travis Slaughter really cared about coming forward to clear your innocence, that he would have came forward. But let's turn the table around. If Trevor Stoddard would truly thought that we was guilty, he'd be in court now, protesting, saying, don't let these guys out because they murderers, they this, this, and that. See, they want to put the prosecutors and the judges want to play the good guy because they know what they did was wrong. Travis did what he had to do at the time for he won't spend the rest of his life in prison. 
and y'all, the, the system allowed him to wiggle through the webs of being convicted of aggravated murder, aggravated murder, aggravated murder, aggravated robbery, and gun specification with a rape charge of a 12 year old. Maurice is 13. And you look at my record, and I never have any dealings with no 13 year old, no 12 year old, no 14 year old. But you look at his, the person that says that we are, in this, that we are guilty of this case. You would look that he's been convicted of rape, statutory rape of a 12 year old, that he was involved with a 13 year old murder case. So where's the, so where's the justice at? If anybody should not be let out of prison, it should be Travis. Because he's the one that seemed to have a troubled youth and be involved in youths. Carl, good luck. I mean, I'm uh, like I said, we're gonna get a story out of there. We're I'm trying to help you because I mean I believe that you are innocent. And there's one thing I want to state for the record too. Andrea, I never met that young lady. Didn't have no knowledge of the young lady, and she said she visited Travis Slaughter in the Lucas County Jail. Travis Slaughter told her, you remember Carl and Wayne, Bob and Wayne She said, I never heard them names before. So when she said she never heard them names before, he said, remember I told you this. She said, no, you told me that you did it by yourself. So he said that he wanted, he not going, he don't feel comfortable going to see the prosecutors and the detectives anymore on his own making her carry weight of his, of his. And then that's when they started talking to her. Then she said that we did a three-way phone call, that we was all online, that she heard us confess to this case. There's no record of us having that conversation. If that conversation truly happened and we was, in, we was incarcerated, they should be able to pull up them files and them records. Did she say that she overheard the phone call when you guys were all in jail? We was all, on, we was all, we was all supposed to be incarcerated, and we was all supposed to be talking to her, and that we, we told her about what we did. Then she wrote an affidavit years later saying that that, that, that uh, conversation never transpired, that three-way conversation never tra transpired. But if that's how they got an indictment, because of what she said, and then she wrote an affidavit saying that she didn't, that, that this never transpired. Why is we still incarcerated? And not only that, if that's, if that's if Chandria was the state new witnesses to get an indictment, when Chandria was found contempt of court, why didn't the case get stopped right then and there? Because your new witnesses is incarcerated on contempt of court. Yeah. Now Chandria, when she did testify, and she only testified briefly, but she said. Yeah, Travis always used to hang out with Wayne and Carl. They yeah. used to hang out all the time. Is that true? No. You didn't used to hang out with Travis? I used to hang out with Wayne, mm -hmm. but it's only, it's, I wouldn't even say I hung out with Travis over 10 times. I don't think, I don't think it was 10 times. You seen, when you seen Wayne, you seen me. Only time you didn't see me and Wayne together, more that time, was when I was incarcerated at CCNO. And the record would state that I went to CCNO in January 98 and I didn't get released to April. Mm -hmm. Well, May. So, if I, so during that period of time, I wasn't with Wayne or Travis. And when I came home, I had a chance, I had to, I had to get, re, get reestablished because Travis then broke into my mom's house and stole all my property. So would I, so I would, so if he, if he got my property, why would I go continue to go hang with him? After you done went in my mom's house and stole from me. It's a lot of things in this case that wasn't brought to light. Yeah. Not only why would you go hang for him, why would you uh, go kill for him? After he didn't stole from me. And then come to find out that St. Drew wrote ever said that Travis was involved in a homosexual activity. Mm 
and he tried to approach the young man on a, on a homosexual advance, and he said that he's gonna expose Travis, and that's why Travis got mad. So if Travis is come to find out, and he, while he's incarcerated, he find out he have AIDS because of his homosexual activities in, 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 the, in the, while he's incarcerated. Mm -hmm. Then it's a guy down here that Travis actually told that he lied on me and Wayne. Robert Williams. Robert Williams. No. Oh. It was another guy from Toledo that was in, that was it, he, he was in the block with Travis when Travis found out he had AIDS. His name is Ron Allen. Huh. Yeah. And he's willing to come forward and say that he talked to Travis, that he was in a block with Travis around this time and that um, before Travis came back and testified against us and that he found out he had AIDS and he tried to show the same what, what, what actually transpired. Rod Allen? Ron. Ronald Allen. Oh, Ronald. Is he still incarcerated? Yes, he down here. Okay. He said that he was in. He said he was in a block with Travis Slaughter in 2000, but 98, not 98, but 99 in 2000. That he was in a block with Travis Slaughter, and Travis Slaughter came to find, came to him and said that he had AIDS and revealed what happened, what he did to us, what he's about to do to us. And you, I told Donna Flowers, my my son's mother, that you um, that you may be want to be interested in talking to her. She said you call her that you will, um, that she would be willing to take your call and talk to you and um, whatever you need to get questions that you need answered, that she'd be able to answer for you. I don't I don't know her phone number. Four one nine three eight six seven five five one. Seven five five one. Yes. Four one nine three eight six seven five five one. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. She said that she'd be willing to talk to you. Good. I would say my sister Kiva Johnson, who also is actually at, but Kiva was attacked back in two thousand and two, and she had severe brain damage, and so I don't, I, I really can't say how her memory is because of the trauma that she has suffered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I'll reach out to Donna. See what we can do, man. None of it makes sense to me. And a lot of things I'm saying, it's like, if you actually, if you actually just look at the situation of uh, how everything transpired from the crime we got arrested and then we get, we get, they let us go. If the state really had any doubt that we was involved in this case, you believe they would have let us go? And then come back nine months later and say they have no witness and evidence. Is that, is that how long it was between the first time they took it to the grand jury and the second time? Yes. Nine months? Yes. Hmm. In the course of the nine months, I never left Toledo, Ohio. You could have run away. If I, was, if I felt that I was involved in this, that like a possibility that something can come up. But how can something come up when you know you're innocent? Where do I have to run from? So after the after they came back with the no bill the first time, I mean you're probably like, yeah, I'm just bumping. This would be the last question, I swear. <laughs> so when they came back with the no bill the first time, you're like, cool. They finally realized that we had I ain't had to do, do with this. this. Yeah, I went home. I called a couple people. I'm like I'm home. I like I told you I ain't had nothing to do with this. And like, I knew you ain't had nothing to do with this. I knew you ain't had nothing to do with this. I'm thinking like, hey, I, I, I get my life back. Whoo, that was a close call. You know, man, I ain't, ain't nothing, man. I told what, man, I'm about to change my life. I got a baby on the way. I'm, saying, I'm, about, to, I'm, about, to, I'm, I'm about to get my life together, man. We've been playing it. We, we, we've, been, we've been out here, and it's time to actually get our stuff together. Our stuff, meaning who? Far as he need to get it, whatever he wanted to do with his life. Oh, Wayne, and you? Yes, he need, whatever he want to do with his life. He want to play basketball. He want to go back to school. He want to get a job. Whatever you, man, live your life, man. Me, I'm about to, I'm about to get a job. 
I'm about to get really involved in my relationship and I'm about to just fall back because I'm not, I, I'm, I, I, that was the first time I ever was in something that serious and that deep and knowing I'm innocent and knowing how the possibility of how things could have turned out then. So I'm never thinking about how it can come back because I never thinking it was gonna come back because Peter Boyer, he seen me before, I got re before we got released from the Lucas County Jail in 1998, September the 15th. He said, Carl, the grand jury didn't choose to indict you, that they gave you a no bill, you should be getting released. The only way they can come back is they come back with new witness and new evidence. I said, you would never have to worry about them coming back with new witness and new evidence because we are actually innocent. I know I am. I wasn't with Wayne. I wasn't with Travis. I was with Donna Flowers. He said, well, they believe you, you're going home today. I said, thank you for your help. Never in my wildest dreams in a million years would I think they would have came back. Because they never had nothing to come back with. So what are you thinking when they came back? They came back and got you. I say, man, this some BS. Then I didn't turn myself in. I knew that I knew they had a warrant off on me. Because Peter Boyer told me they had a warrant, an active warrant off on me. But I told Pete Boyer, I'm not going, I'm, I'm, I'm not about to turn myself back in. I'm not going back to jail. I ain't got nothing to do with this. They on some bullshit. I told him that's exactly my same word. He said, well, Mr. Willis, you know they got a warrant for you. I said, I ain't leaving Toledo, but at the same time, I'm not about to, I'm not about to turn myself in. So where'd you go? I lived my life. I went from my sister's house to Madonna's house to my, uh, my lady Charmaine, who I'm with now. And they, I'm like, man, my dad come like, you ain't had nothing to do with this, turn yourself in. I said, dad, I already went through this process before. I'm not about to sit in the county jail for something I ain't doing. I don't have nothing to do with this. How can they come with an indictment when they don't have no new witness, no new evidence whatsoever to come with a new indictment? He said they had to come back with something. I said, how can they come back with anything when I'm innocent? He said, let me look into this. He called Pete Boyer again, and we went out to Pete Boyer's office. Pete Boyer said, I don't know what the new witness is or new evidence is, but they came to the grand jury and said the grand jury rewarded them with an indictment this time. Only, I didn't know nothing about Sandria until the day of my trial. I never seen this woman, never heard of her name, don't know who she is. Pete Boyer didn't even know who she was. And when Pete Boyer tried to talk to her before my trial, she didn't even want to talk to Pete Boyer. So I told Pete Boyer like, well, what's going on? I, mean, I thought she said you go talk to like she don't want to talk to us. I said, what you mean she don't want to talk to us? He said she don't. She 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 acting real funny. She, I was like, man, I don't. She, she don't know me. I don't know her. So he so Wayne attorney asked, do you know her? Wayne said, I don't know her. I don't got. I don't know nothing about her. She don't know me. So they drug her in the courtroom. She got on the stand. She said her age. She said her name. And she stayed with school, and then she stopped asking questions. Then they sit there. The judge said, "If you don't ask, if you don't continue to answer these questions, that you can be held to contempt of court." They said, "Hold on, I, I take that back." The judge, Judith Ann Lanzinger, told the jury to go to the liberation room. While we was all in the courtroom. She told her, if you don't ask these questions, you know that you could be held in contempt of court. She said, yes, I acknowledge that. So she said, I'm gonna bring these people, I'm gonna bring the jury back out here, and you need to continue to answer these questions. This is a serious matter. So the jury came, the jury came back out and filled up the jury box, and she, the prosecutor proceeded to answer her questions. She didn't answer no questions. She said, you got one more time not to answer this question. I'm gonna have to, I'm, I'm, I will be forced to hit me, um, to hold you in contempt of court. So she asked, the prosecutor asked her one more question. And when the she tried to ask her one more question, she ain't answering. So she, the judge said, we find you a contempt of court, 30 days CCNO. Boom. 
right then and there, I'm like, oh, we're about to go. Because right then and there, they're supposed, the, they supposed to stop the trial. If this your new witness that you got an indictment on, she don't want to testify. How can we proceed with this trial? The only thing you got is Travis, and Travis can get us an indictment. And the jury was not to consider any of her testimony. That's correct? what they said. That's what they told her. Yeah. That that she, Jan, Judith Ann Langer said, disregard her as if she is never here. How can you disregard her as she is never here when they seen her? I can tell you that I talked to a member of the, the jury, and he said they did not disregard her. That they took it as she was the only person that said these three guys had a relationship with But they're supposed to disregard it, though. And then, just so how, how did, how did Judith Ann Lanziger get appointed to Supreme Court from this case? It was all a political move. They didn't give a damn on what happened to me, Wayne, or Maurice. They knew they had Travis. They knew they thought they had her. They didn't have her. And so... But they didn't realize they didn't have her. They had Travis, and they was like, let them deal with this. They sent two innocent men to prison. I know they sent one innocent man for sure, which is Carl Willis, because I ain't had nothing to do with this. Even when we went back to our hearing back in 2017, I tried to talk then, but Jennifer um, Padgett, my attorney from the Innocent Project, she told me that I, she told me I'm not gonna put you on the stand. I told her I, I get on the stand. I talk. I still want to talk. Y'all give. I take a lie detector test. Y'all can have my DNA. Y'all can have whatever y'all want. Y'all cannot find anything to link me to this case. That's why the Innocent Project took my case. Rarely seldom do they take a case without no DNA. Did you take a lie detector test for the Innocence Project? They, want, they, they, they said they didn't need it. Yeah. Okay. I'll take one for you. I don't have no problem with it. Yeah. That's an interesting idea, but I don't know if we could do that. Um, hmm. I don't have no problem with it. Yeah. You can have my DNA. You can have, you can have whatever you need for me to do to prove my innocence. I would do it. I don't have nothing to hide. I never seen Maurice, don't know Maurice, don't have, a part, don't have any connection to Maurice or his case. Right. And that's just the honest God truth. I'm not here to try to sell a story. I'm not here to try to convince anybody. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm innocent. I'm tired of it. Yeah, I understand. I My mom in the hospital right now. She's been in the hospital for a month. What what's uh, wrong with your mom? She for, she had she had two bottles she had two bottles of um, cancer, mm. and she just recently got sick again last month. And when she got sick, she was on a um, a, um, a a costume bag, and somehow her bag got in, um, infected, which her, um, ki her her kidney started to fail, and all of a sudden all kind of complications didn't, didn't, didn't uh, happen. And now she's just they just trying to get her back to health. My, this right here is, is tearing my mom apart. My dad already passed. When did your dad die? 2014, September the 9th. And he believed in your innocence till the end? Totally. One thing about me, if I have, if I'm, if, if I have any, if I do something wrong, I'm man enough to take responsibility and say I messed up. So you messed up when you were younger. Yeah, I, I, everything that I got in trouble with, I admitted that I got in trouble in that. Even when I got, since I've been incarcerated, if I did something wrong, I sit there and say, I did something wrong. If I didn't do nothing, I'm not gonna sit there and try to get out of something I didn't do. I'm gonna try to, I'm try to get the best, the best situation, get we get past this and try to get the best situation out. I'm saying, if I gotta sit in a hole, if I gotta sit in a college, whatever it may be, let's get this over with because I'm guilty of this and let's move on. Put this behind us. I can't put this behind me until I'm actually free. 
because I don't have nothing to do with it. How can you put something behind you when you free when you're innocent and you're still incarcerated? Every day that I'm incarcerated is the day injustice. This right here is totally injustice. And you you said you went through my paperwork. You don't have you're not invested in the innocent project, you're not invested in the court. What would your findings? Well, I mean, I don't think he did. I don't. So that's just as a intelligent guy looking at all the paperwork and um, all the stuff that the jury did not know. Um, and I can tell you the jury was frustrated because they believed there was more to the story. That they were not being told. And they did not know what the deal was with Chandrea. They did not know, obviously, that you wanted to testify. Um, I think if you would have testified, it would have made a difference with the jury. Um, I had to believe my counsel. Mm -hmm. He haven't took a, He said he haven't took a murder case since my trial. Yeah, I talked to him. He said he left his briefcase and his uh, coat in the in the courtroom, drove around for three hours, never took another murder trial. That it traumatized him that much because he believed so much that you were innocent. So. Why can't the why can't the court see it? What do what do what do Lazarus have against me to continue to deny me justice and make me continue to suffer and remain in prison? Not only are you affecting me, you affecting my children, you affecting my family. Is it too hard to go back to the to the purified family and say that you made a mistake that you sent the innocent man to prison? Your career mean that much to you? That you'd rather have him personally in prison than to go back and say you made a mistake? No. Because the purified family, they still, they still, they still, they still haven't got an answer or closure. Because as long as I'm in prison, they'll never have a closure, a correct closure anyway. Because the person that's responsible for this is on the other side of that fence. They had my case from 2012 when we started filing motions in Lucas County Common Pleas, and they had new, they knew they knew uh, Travis affidavit, and Transgender came forward with her affidavit. Why would you release Travis and then bring me to court and then try to say that Travis didn't show up because he didn't because he don't because because of whatever reason? And you really truly wanted justice, you would have made sure Travis wasn't released from prison, and that all of it showed up was conveyed back to the Lucas County Common Police Court. Yeah. Yeah. You go release this man back to society, knowing it's a strong possibility, which is the truth, that he's a pedophile and a murderer. Yeah. But you can sleep knowing damn well that you have an innocent man in prison.